Amen. Here in Exodus chapter number 23, we're going to begin reading in verse number 20. I want to focus on verse number 20 quickly. Behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him and obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. But if thou shalt indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak... <clears throat> Then I will be an enemy unto thine enemies and an adversary unto thine adversaries. Verse 23. For mine angels shall go before thee and bring thee in unto the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites, the Hivites and the Jebusites. And I will cut them off. So here in verses 20 through verse 23, chapter number 23 here of the book of Exodus, we see a specific angel being spoken of that's talked about that God is going to send before the children of Israel. God is going to send this angel and he is going to be leading the children of Israel into the promised land. Well, I have read uh, um, uh, many commentaries. I've, I've read many dissertations and I've probably read maybe three or four different articles of people identifying who this angel is over the past five, six, maybe seven years of when I've been studying my Bible. And uh, I'm going to show you <clears throat> the clear teaching, at least one of them. Now, I believe that there are multiple applications, but there's always a literal application to this. There's always, you know, uh, when there are double applications, a spiritual and a physical application, one of them is the literal application. There's, of course, a, a further spiritual fulfillment off into the future, but there's a literal application that can be clearly identified. And I'm going to show you, according to Scripture, who this angel is tonight. It's very interesting. Now, I want you to go to Revelation chapter number 22, verse number 8. Tonight is going to be more of a Bible study. We're going to be flipping back and forth quite a bit. You might as well take a bulletin or any piece or leaf of paper that you have in front of you and go ahead and slide that in to Exodus chapter 23 because you're going to repeatedly be going back to Exodus chapter number 23. Now, a lot of people start off on the wrong foot immediately when they see the word angel. A lot of people uh, have the misconception that angel can only or exclusively be referring to a celestial being. Uh, even a lot of times people will refer to it as an angelic being. But the word angel just means messenger. There are people that are referred to as angels in the Bible when these are just normal men. They are just regular men. I want you to look here in Revelation chapter number 22. We're going to look at verse number 8 of an example of that. <clears throat> this is John in the book of Revelation. He says this, And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen them, and seen, I'm sorry, I fell down to worship me before the feet of the what? The angel which showed me these things. Verse 9. <clears throat> then saith he, that's the angel, Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant. And then he says this, And of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of the book, worship God. So we can see here that, that John <coughs> identifies this man as an angel. And this man says to John when he falls down before his feet, hey, I am of thy fellow servants. And then he specifically says, I'm, I'm one of your brethren. I'm a brother of you. So what does that mean? That they are both spiritually brothers. That means that they are both sons of God, aren't they? Now the Bible just clearly tells us in Hebrews chapter number 1, it says, Unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Now, clearly, God has never said unto an angel that that angel is his son. Now, I've, I've heard, and I'm sure everyone has heard here recently, that what is meant by that is that when he says, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, that the son, the portion of him, them not being the son, is the type of son that has been begotten. But that's not true because the very next verse disproves that. He says, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, and again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Tying in the concept of saying that he's, it's, not, it's not his son. It's not referring to the being begotten. It's referring to that they are not his sons. Angels are not the sons of God. Therefore, when this man looks at John and says, Hey, you're my brother, he even says he's of the prophets. Also, further proof of that. But he says, Hey, I, I'm your brother. You're my brother. What? Why are they brothers? Because they're both sons of God. You know, why are we brothers and sisters in here? Because we're all sons of God. So we have a normal man, a man that has been redeemed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, <clears throat> being sent to bring a message. 
and he's a messenger. What does it mean to be a messenger? It means to be an angel. Now, oftentimes, those that were sent in the Old Testament to bring a message, they are referred to as messengers or as angels in the Old Testament, and they just so happen to be celestial beings, beings from heaven. So that is why oftentimes people have the misconception that an angel has to be a celestial being or it has to be a being, a being from heaven, but it does not. So we have a clear example of that. And this is where people oftentimes start off on the wrong foot in Exodus 23. Go back to Exodus chapter number 23. That's the first thing that I want you to understand is that an angel does not have to refer to a celestial being. I just showed you an example of that. I couldn't think of any others, but I would be hard-pressed to believe that there aren't any other examples in the Bible of an angel referring to a man. Maybe you could do a Bible study. Possibly that's the only example, but that's really the only example you need to prove that. And then the word itself just means messenger. So here when he says, verse 20, Behold, I send an angel before thee. What is he saying? I'm sending a messenger. I'm sending someone before you. Who goes before someone? This is an army. The nation of Israel is an army. If we read down further, look at verse 22, or 23, I'm sorry. For mine angel shall go before thee and bring thee in unto the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. And what does it say? And I will cut them off. So what's he talking about that's going to happen? There's going to be a war, isn't it? He's saying, I'm going to bring you into this land where the Gentiles are, where the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Hittites, all these people are located, the Jebusites. And what does he say? This angel is going to go before you, and you're going to cut them off. So what's going on? There's a war going on in there. They're fighting. So who's the one that goes before them? What would he be called? Maybe a captain or a leader or something like that, right? I want you to go to Deuteronomy chapter number 1, verse number 38. Deuteronomy chapter number 1, verse number 38. Now... <clears throat> Who was the leader that brought them out of Egypt? What was his name? Moses brought them out of Egypt, right? Moses brought them out of Egypt and he, <coughs> he led them forth into many battles. They fought a lot of battles when, when uh, Moses was their leader, right? Uh, Moses was the captain of the army of hosts at that time, of the army of Israel, if you will. He was their captain. He was their leader. And he sent them forth into battle. Now, who led them through the wilderness? Moses, right? But did Moses, was Moses the one that actually led them into the land of Israel? He was not. Who was? Joshua. Joshua. I want you to look at Deuteronomy chapter number 1, verse number 38. Deuteronomy chapter number 1, verse number 38. Let's start up a little earlier than that, though. Um, let's look at uh, verse 34. And the Lord heard the voice of your words and was wroth and sware, saying, Surely there shall not one of these men of these this evil generation see that good land which I swear to give unto your fathers. Talking about the 12 tribes, uh, or the 12 spies of the 12 tribes. Ten of them brought back an evil report, and two of them, Caleb and Joshua, uh, they, those two men brought back a good report. They trusted in the Lord and thought that they would be able to defeat them. And that's what it tells us here in verse 36. Look at verse 36. Say, Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, he shall see it. And to him will I give the land that he hath trodden upon, and to his children, because he hath wholly followed the Lord. Look at verse 37. Also the Lord was angry with me. This is Moses speaking. For your sake, saying, Thou also shalt not go in thither. Now look at verse 38. But Joshua, the son of Nun, which standeth before thee, he shall go in thither. Watch this. Encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit. inherit. Now notice who is going to be going before them or causing them or leading them, causing them to inherit the land. Who do we see here? It says Joshua very plainly, doesn't it? I want you to look over at Deuteronomy chapter number 3, verse number 26. Deuteronomy chapter number 3, verse number 26. We'll see this again. <coughs> but the Lord was wroth with me for your sakes and would not hear me. And the Lord said unto me, let it suffice thee. Speak no more unto me of this matter. Verse 27. Get thee up into the top of Pisgah. And lift up thine eyes westward, and northward, and southward, and eastward, and behold it with thine eyes, for thou shalt not go over this Jordan. Verse 28. But charge Joshua, and encourage him, and strengthen him. Now I want you to pay close attention to the wording here. But for he shall go over before this people, and he shall cause them to inherit the land which thou shalt 
seed. Now go back to Exodus chapter number 23, if you will. If you still have that piece of paper there, I accidentally pulled mine out. But go back to Exodus chapter number 23 while keeping your hand here in Deuteronomy chapter... <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter number 3. We're going to look at Exodus chapter number 23 one more time. I want you to notice what it says one more time in verse 20. Behold, I send an angel, it says this, before thee to keep thee into the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. Skip down to verse number 23 again. For mine angels shall go before thee and bring thee in unto the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites, the Hivites and the Jebusites. And he says, and I will cut them off. So notice that this angel is going to be going before the nation of Israel, isn't it? This angel is going to be sent before the nation of Israel. And then we see that Joshua is a specific man that has been chosen to go before the nation of Israel. We see the, the actual, the same wording that was used when we read in Exodus chapter 23. Look again, uh, I'm sorry, Deuteronomy 3, 28. But charge Joshua and encourage him, strengthen him, for he shall go over before this people. Notice the exact same wording. And he shall cause them... To inherit the land which thou shalt see. I want you to go back to Exodus chapter number 23 again. Exodus chapter number 23. One more thing I want to point out to you in verse number 20. It says this, Behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way, and to bring thee into the place which I have, I have prepared. Verse 21. Beware of him. Exodus 23, 21. Beware of him and obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions. And then he says this, For my name... Is in him. Now, I believe there are different layers to this. There are secondary layers that we can learn from. But one thing that we can definitely walk away and know for a fact is that there is obviously a, an angel that God is referring to that is in somewhat and, or in some sort different than himself or distinct than, than himself. The way to prove that here is that it says, <clears throat> for my name is in him. If it was just him himself in every way and there was no distinction, would it make sense for him, for God to say, my name is in him? That wouldn't make sense, would it? Prior to that, he refers to him repeatedly, beware of him and obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgression. So there's obviously a distinction between God and this particular angel. Now, oftentimes, if you read commentaries on, on who they believe that this is, a lot of people will just say they believe that it's God himself. Now, I believe that that is a, a, an answer to this. We can talk more about that after the service if you're interested in my views on that. I can show you passages in the Bible where God clearly says that he's going to go before them and cause them to inherit the land. But we can see that it's obviously also referring to someone else, isn't it? It says, my, he says, my name is in him. You could not say that if you were just referring just directly to yourself. There's obviously some sort of a distinction between the angel that's going to go before them and then God himself. So I wanted to point that out. But another thing I want you to notice in, in uh, Exodus 23, uh, verse number 21, it says this, Beware of him and obey his voice. <coughs> Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions. I want you to go over to Joshua chapter number 1. Joshua chapter number 1. You can see this same idea actually being spoken of about Joshua. Joshua chapter number 1, verse number 16. <coughs> Joshua chapter number 1, verse number 16. And they answered Joshua. Joshua 1, 16. And they answered Joshua saying, All that thou commandest us, we will do. And whithersoever thou sendest us, we will go. Verse 17. According as we hearken unto Moses in all things, so will we hearken unto thee. Only the Lord thy God be with thee as he was with Moses. Now watch verse 18. Whosoever he be that doth rebel against thy commandment and will not hearken unto thy words in all that thou commandest him, he shall be put to death. Notice this exact same statement is made about who? It's about Joshua. If you flip over there again, if you would have read one more time, just to compare it back and forth, Exodus chapter number 23. Again, it was verse number 22. It says, but if thou shalt, but if thou shalt indeed obey his voice, I'm sorry, verse, verse 21, beware of him and obey his voice, provoke him not. And he says, for he will not pardon your transgressions. Saying that there will be a punishment. Notice that this angel, you can see, is clearly not Moses either. When you look at this passage, it's clearly someone at this point that has not been identified. It would not make sense to be referring to Moses and speaking about this angel when Moses was already the messenger. He was already the leader. 
But God says, hey, I'm going to send my angel before you, and he's going to cause you to inherit. Because that angel was not yet the leader. That angel was Joshua to be, uh, uh, who was to, was to be the leader later on. Now, <clears throat> I want to look at my name is in him as well. So we're identifying all these characteristics, and every single one of them, all of the identifiers, all point us to Joshua every time. Look over at, uh, at Exodus 23. Again, we're going to read it one more time so it's fresh in your mind. Verse 21 we just read. Beware of him and obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions. Now notice this. For my name is in him. Isn't that an interesting statement? Why, why should you obey and why should you do all these things? He makes a statement. For my name is in him. My name is in him. I want you to flip over to Acts chapter number 7, verse number 37. Acts chapter number 7, verse number 37. Acts chapter number 7, verse number 37. Now this is, <coughs> this is Stephen right before he was martyred. He's preaching and he, is, uh, he's, he has a, a, you know, a, a long sermon, he, uh, a, a, a dissertation or an overview is what I was going to say, of the Old Testament. That's what he's preaching. He gives an entire overview of what took place in the Old Testament. And right here we see in verse 37 of Acts chapter number 7, Stephen is talking about Moses. He says this in verse 37. This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, Prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto, unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear. Let's skip down. Let's go to verse 39. To whom our fathers would not obey. This is talking about Moses still, but thrust him from them, and in their hearts turned back again into Egypt, saying unto Aaron, Make us gods to go before us, for as for this Moses which brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days, and offered sacrifice unto, unto the idol, and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven. As it is written in the book of the prophets, O ye house of Israel, have ye offered to be slain beasts and sacrifice? Sacrifices by the space of 40 years in the wilderness. Yea, he took up the tabernacle of Molech and the star of your god Remphan, figures which he made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Verse 44 and verse 45. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as he appointed, speaking unto Moses that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen. Look at verse 45. Which also our fathers that came after, so came after Moses, brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles whom God drave out before the face of our fathers <clears throat> unto the days of David. Now, a lot of people, when they read the Bible for the first time, <clears throat> this verse might confuse them because you know what, what name is found there that, that you're not expecting to see is what? The name Jesus, right? A lot of the, I actually looked up practically every single Bible version just a few minutes in my, a uh, few minutes ago in my office to see if it's changed since, you know, maybe five, six years ago when I looked this up the last time. All of the new modern Bible versions, all of them, change the name Jesus here to Joshua. Now, who is it talking about? It's talking about Joshua, right? It's talking about Joshua of the Old Testament. When you look at verse 45, it says, which also our fathers that came after Brought in, it says, with Jesus. It's talking about who we know from the Old Testament as Joshua. And it says, in with Jesus. That's Joshua into the possession of the Gentiles. Now, who are the Gentiles? The Amorites, the Jebusites, the you know, uh, Hittites, the, uh, the Hivites, right? All of them. That's who it's talking about, right? Now, why does it use the name Jesus? Because Joshua is the name Jesus. Now, all of the modern Bible versions, all of them, Change this to Joshua. I just looked up every practically every one that I can think of, all the way to ones that are hardly ever used, but are you know, but somewhat talked about, like the Good News for Modern Man. I mean, I looked up the ESV, all of them, every one of them says Joshua. That is an incorrect translation. That is not correct. Joshua is the translation from Hebrew to English. Jesus is the translation from Greek. To English. It's not the same. The letters are different. You, you, to, to correctly translate that name, you have to translate the way that the word is in Hebrew and how the letters are, are, are formed and originate into English in the same exact way. It has to do with pronunciation and things like that as well. It's not the same. So it is. So they think what they're doing is they're, they're preventing confusion by making sure that you understand that it's Joshua. But what they're really doing is preventing you from understanding your Bible. Because what happens is you read here in Acts chapter number 7, 
it causes confusion for a moment. You look it up and you figure out who it's talking about. And you know what you determine? You determine that the name of Jesus is the same as the name of Joshua. This actually occurs one other time in your Bible. So that makes it that much easier. When it comes up two times, both times you figure out it's talking about who. We're going to look at that in just a moment. It's talking about Joshua of the Old Testament. And then you can clearly see. I looked at all of the translations prior to the King James Bible. What do you think that they translated it as? Get, take a guess. Jesus. All of them. I looked at the Wycliffe. I looked at the Tyndale just a few minutes ago. I'd never done that before. All of them translated as Jesus. But you know why? The correct translation is Jesus. And it's meant to be that way. It's so that you can learn something from it. <clears throat> you know what the name Joshua is? You know what it means? It's Jesus. And it means Jehovah saves. So notice that you don't need to know Hebrew to know that. And this is a little truth that we can, that we can further shed light on Exodus chapter number 23. So when God says, my name is in him, and we see all the other identifiers pointing to Joshua, right? We get to the New Testament, we read a passage about when they go into the land of Israel, the land of the Canaanites, who does the New Testament say took them in? What name does it use? Jesus. That's interesting, isn't it? I want you to turn now. Let's go back to, uh, let's go to Numbers chapter number 13. I don't know if you've ever noticed this. This is very easy to read over. But did you ever notice that Joshua's name was changed at one point? Joshua's name was actually changed at one point. God, when, when, when a man's name is changed in the Bible, it's always for a particular reason. It's always normally when they're beginning to, to, be, to begin a ministry for the Lord. You see uh, Abram's name being changed to Abraham when the covenant is finalized and all of that, right? W what happened with Paul? As soon as God chooses him and, and starts to begin to use him, what does he do? He changes his name from Saul to Paul. What happens with Jacob? As soon as he makes the covenant with him, what does he do? He changes his name to Israel. As soon as a man is getting ready to begin a work for God... As soon as he's getting ready to do some sort of work for the Lord, God will often, before he begins the ministry, he'll change his name. That's very common or very often uh, takes place in the Bible. Look at Numbers chapter 13. Verse number 1 says this, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send now men that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. Of every tribe of their fathers shall ye send a man, every one a ruler among them. And Moses, by the commandment of the Lord, sent them <coughs> from the wilderness of Paran. All those men were heads of the children of Israel. And these were their names of the tribe of Reuben, Shemua, the son of Zachor. Of the tribe of Simeon, Shaphat, the son of Horai. Of the tribe of Judah, Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. Of the tribe of Issachar, Egal, the son of Joseph. Of the tribe of Ephraim, watch this, Oshia, the son of Nun. Now who is the son of Nun? Who is well known as the son of Nun in the Bible? Joshua is the son of Nun. There's, a, there, you know, there's a, a joke amongst independent fundamental Baptists. I don't know if I've told it to you guys before, but who is, I'll tell it to you now, right behind the pulpit, who is the only person in the Bible that didn't have any parents? Anybody? Yeah, Joshua, the son of Nun. I mean, it was pretty easy. I'll, I'll get you that later on. You forget about the joke later. Joshua, because he's the son of Nun. Or most people are like, Adam and Eve, or hey, Kizildek. It's like, I'm not, I'm not trying to be doctrinal here. It's funny, okay? <laughs> so he's here, Numbers chapter number 13. <clears throat> I want you to notice, like it says in, uh, it says, well, where was that verse where Oshia is mentioned? Se uh, eight. It says, Oshia, the son of Nun. Well, something very interesting, if you skip down, I want you to look at verse 16. It says this, these are the names of the men which Moses sent to spy out the land. And Moses called Oshia, it says this, the son of of none, Jehoshua. So notice his name is changed. Now, does anyone know what Oshia means in Hebrew? It means salvation. The only reason why I know that is because I can deduce its process of elimination because what does Joshua mean? Well, we know that the Jeha always means Jehovah. Well, Jesus or Joshua means Jehovah saves. So do you know what his name was prior to it being changed? It was just salvation. But do you know what his name was once his name was changed? His name, yeah, Jehovah's name was then in him, wasn't it? Jehovah saves. Jehovah saves, and his name was then what? Joshua, or if we look at it from Greek to English, what would it be? <clears throat> Jesus, right? <clears throat> once you go to Hebrews, go to the book of Hebrews. This is the second mention in the New Testament. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter number 4. Now, Hebrews chapter number 4 just plainly tells you that 
Joshua of the Old Testament was he who led them into the land of Canaan, that he was the angel that actually gave them rest. <coughs> now you have to, uh, it could confuse you if you don't understand what it's actually teaching, so I'll explain to you real quickly. So look at Hebrews chapter 4 verse 1. Let us therefore fear, lest they promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest. As he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. Verse 5, and in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest. Now I want you to pay attention to verse number 6. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and, the, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Now what rest is it talking about that the first group didn't enter into because of unbelief? It's talking about the rest of going into the physical promised land. Isn't that correct? It's talking about that they weren't able to go into the land of Canaan specifically. Now, now was that the permanent rest or was that the temporary rest? It was the temporary rest, wasn't it? It was the land of Canaan, but is it the true land of Canaan? Is it truly the land that Abraham was offered for him and for his seed? No, it's not because the Bible says, and that's actually in Acts 7. I tried to quote that the other night, and Brother Rick and I looked it up. But the Bible actually says in Acts chapter number 7 that Abraham, while he was on this earth, he never received that land. It says so much as to put his foot in. So he never got any of that land. But he was still promised you're going to have this land because it wasn't that physical property. It wasn't that physical land. It's New Jerusalem. So right here, notice that it says that they didn't enter into that rest. So that was considered a rest, wasn't it? But it was a temporary rest. It was not the fulfillment of the real rest, the spiritual rest, and the real promise, which is the promised land in heaven, New Jerusalem. So look at verse number 7. Again, he limiteth a certain day, saying, In David, so David said this, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Now, I want you to pay close attention to verse number 8. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he, he's talking about David, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. Now, when it says Jesus there, who do you think it's talking about? It's talking about Joshua of the Old Testament, right? So what it's saying is if Joshua had given them rest, then would not have afterward, then would not he have afterward have spoken of another day. Now, the children of Israel, they thought that that was their rest, didn't they? They thought when they you know, came into the promised land, they thought when they came into the physical land of Israel, they thought, hey, I finally rested. I'm finally here where I'm supposed to be. But that was not really their rest. And that's what this passage is explaining, that David, after they were already ready in the promised land, would not afterwards have to speak of rest to come if that was the rest in the first place. You wouldn't need to talk about a rest anymore because you're already there. You would already have rested or be resting right now. The, what the passage is teaching is that that is not the fulfillment of the rest. There was a rest there, though, wasn't there? There was a physical rest. Now, that's the point that you need to understand is this. When Paul's writing this, which I believe Paul would be the author of the book of Hebrews, when Paul is writing this, he's writing this to a Hebrew audience that is supposed to be familiar with the Old Testament, isn't it? And he knows that the people writing this or reading this, the Hebrews, who are they going to think gave them rest? Joshua. Their presupposition for reading the Old Testament is, hey, what happened? Joshua gave them rest, isn't it? Joshua's the one that gave them rest. So who led them into the promised land? According to them, Joshua. Do you understand that point? That's very important. But when you get here, it says, for if Jesus had given them rest, the same Joshua, if he really had, I know you think he'd given them rest, but if he had really given them rest, then David would have not afterwards have spoken of another day. Does that all make sense? So notice who Joshua is here. What's the name that's used? It's the name of Jesus, isn't it? So who was the one that really led them into that land and gave them rest? The physical land in the Old Testament. It was Jesus, wasn't it? God said that he was going to send an angel before them, didn't he? Once you go back to the Old Testament, go back to Exodus chapter number 23. We'll look at that passage one more time. So we saw first there in Exodus chapter number 23... 
that this angel is going to go before thee, right? Who did it say later on went before them? It said Joshua went before them, didn't he? He said he was going to send Joshua. Moses actually appointed or ordained Joshua, and it used the exact phrase that he was going to go before them, didn't he? When did he, when did he go before them? What was the reason that he went before them? To lead them into the way. What was he? He was their leader, wasn't he? Then we look further down, and what was it? it it's, it's into battle. What did Joshua do? What was the purpose of Joshua leading them into battle, right? He was the captain of the army, wasn't he? He was actually, he was not just a leader, you know, sitting back. He was actually the captain of the army. That's why it's worded there when you look at verse number 23 that there's going to be battles that are taking place. There's going to be fighting that's taking place. Not only that, number 22, we see... Verse number 22 in chapter number 23, we see that they have to obey his voice so there's going to be consequences and that their transgressions will not be forgiven. That is also spoken of of who? Joshua, wasn't it? They said that they had to obey his voice and if they didn't, what was going to happen? They were going to be put to death, right? Not only that, the person speaking to him said what? Here's another hint. My name is in him. What was his name prior? Oshawa. And what? Right before Moses died, what did he do? laid his hands on him, and then the Bible makes sure that it gives you that little nugget of truth. And Moses called Oshua, Jehoshua, which is what? Jehovah salvation. Now I want you to think about this. The person that's speaking here in verse number 20 is who? It's the Lord. It's Jehovah. It's God of the Old Testament. And what does he say there in verse number 21? <clears throat> Beware of him and obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions. And then Jehovah of the Old Testament says this, For my name is in him. Who was the angel that led them in? Joshua. What's his name in the New Testament? Jesus. Go to Matthew. Keep your hand here. Go to Matthew chapter number 1. Matthew chapter number 1. <coughs> Matthew chapter number 1. <coughs> it says this, in Matthew chapter 1, don't you look at verse number 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away brutally. Verse 20, But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Pay close attention to verse 21. <clears throat> and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. You know what Jesus' name was? If you, you were speaking to somebody in the Old Testament, or if you were reading his name, it's Joshua. Keep reading there, verse 22. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted, which being interpreted is God with us. Verse 24, then Jesus being raised from sleep did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took him and his wife and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son. And it says this, and he called his name Emmanuel. Jesus. What did God say in the Old Testament when he spoke about the angel that was going to go before him? He said, hey, my name is in him. And what was his name? His name was Jesus. Go back to Exodus chapter number 33. <clears throat> Exodus chapter number 33. <clears throat> now there are secondary applications to this, of course, and we're going to see a part of that right now. But I want you to also understand that Moses knew and Moses understood that there was an angel, a physical angel, which was not an angel from heaven, but a man that was going to be the leader that brought them in. And Moses understood that this must be some leader other than myself. This is going to be a man, and it's not me. Which, I, what is, How surprising would that be to you if you were Moses? When God then tells you, hey, there's going to be an angel that's going to come, there's going to be a messenger, a man that's going to lead them in to the land. What would you say? What am I, chopped liver? Right? Wouldn't you be expecting to, to be the one? Moses, of course. To lead them into the, the land of Israel? I want to show you that, that Moses understood that there was going to be a man that led them in. And it was not himself. Look at, uh, look at verse 12. And Moses said unto the Lord, See thou, see thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people. So what's he saying? You told me to bring up this people, right? 
You were the one that told me to come and get them and be the leader of this people. Now watch. And thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, and that I may find, find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. I want you to go to the very beginning of the chapter. Look at verse 1. <clears throat> and the Lord said unto Moses, Depart and go up hence, thou and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt. That sound familiar? Notice how he just said, You told me to bring up this people out of Egypt. Referring to him, himself being as the leader. Unto the land which I swear unto Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, Unto thy seed will I give it. Now, who does it sound like is going to be that leader to Moses right now? Who does it sound like is going to be that angel? It sounds like it would be himself, doesn't it? Look at verse 2. And I will send an angel before thee, and I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. So notice, right after that, then he says, I'm going to send an angel before thee. Right? When you get down to verse number 12, he says... Responding to what the Lord had just said to him. Speaking about that angel. And Moses said to the Lord, See thou sayest unto me, bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. He's asking, who is this other angel? Who is this? And then he goes on to say, Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name. <laughs> and thou hast also found grace in my sight. He's saying, You've told me that we have a close relationship. You've told me, hey, you know me by name. He's saying, we know we're personal, right? We're not just acquaintances. You know me by name. You see, you're saying that I find grace in your sight. Why are you not telling me who this angel is when you're the one that said, hey, bring this people up? Verse 13, now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight and consider that this nation is thy people. Verse 14, watch this. And he said, my presence shall go with thee. Now watch this closely. And I will give thee rest. Who did it say? Who, who, when they read the Old Testament, all the Hebrews, who did they think gave them rest? Joshua, right? Jesus. They were actually right. They thought maybe that it was that, that it was Joshua, the physical Joshua, that really gave them that rest, right? But that was just the picture of the true rest that was to come. Do you know who really brought them in? Joshua was just a man. He was just fighting by the Lord. That's all that he had. Joshua was that angel, the, the literal man that was chosen and ordained. And God said, hey, my name is in him. But you had the Lord in heaven who was the one that was actually fighting for them and bringing them into the land. And you know who the Lord in heaven is? It's Jesus. Amen. Ultimately, and one day to be the man that was born. And what was his name? My name is in him. What was it? Jesus, which is Jehovah saved. What did he say? I will give them rest. You look in Hebrews chapter 4 and say, if Jesus had given them rest, he doesn't really provide. Man never really provides the rest himself, right? Unless it's God born as a man. I want you to keep reading. There's something interesting further, too, as well. <clears throat> Look at verse 16. For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not in that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, <coughs> I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken. For thou hast found grace in thy sight. And I know thee by name. He's saying, I know you by name, right? Verse 18, and he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And then he says this, verse 20, and he said, Thou canst not see my face, for thou shalt no man see me and live. I want you to think about this quickly. This is just a side note. From the conversation, Moses clearly says, hey, you're the one that told me, referring back to Exodus chapter number 23, right? You're the one that told me that you were going to send an angel before us, right? You, you were the one that said that. Now, whoever was speaking, which we know to be the Lord, said, my name is in that angel. The conversation is brought back up later in Exodus 33. And Moses, speaking unto the Lord, I'm debunking that they are three distinct persons. Moses, speaking unto the Lord, referring back to the same conversation he had previous with the same person, is, is speaking about that, that conversation, and then God responds and says, in verse number 20, and he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me 
and live. You can tie this conversation in with Exodus 23 and prove that it's the same person talking. You can prove that the angel that went before them is Joshua. And that's why the Lord says, my name is in him, because the name is Jesus. And the Lord that's speaking is he who would be born as a man, which would be Jesus. Then you go to Exodus 33. Now that we've established who Exodus 23, who's speaking in Exodus 23, that same person says, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. You know who's talking? He who would once be born and would be the Lord Jesus Christ. Very clear. Right. Keep reading. This isn't a second. This isn't the father, the first person. It was the second person prior. You can tie these conversations together and prove that it's the same person, one person. Look at verse 21. The Lord said, Behold, there is a rock by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass while my glory passeth by that I will put thee in a cliff of the rock and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. I want you to skip down. Real interesting. <coughs> Look at verse 4. And he hewed two tables of stone like unto the first. And Moses rose up early in the morning and went up unto Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him and took in his hand the two tables of stone and the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. Verse 6, And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundance and goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. Verse 8, And Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped, and he said, If now I found grace in thy sight, O Lord, <coughs> let my Lord, I pray thee, go among us. And then he says, For it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for thine inheritance. Verse 10, And he said, Behold, I make a covenant before all thy people, I will do marvels such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation. And all the people among which thou art shall see the work of the Lord, for it is a terrible thing that I will do with thee. Verse 11, Observe thou that which I command thee this day. Behold, I drive out before thee the Amorite and the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land where thou goest, lest it be a snare in the midst of thee. So we can see there at the end that the Lord says, hey, do you know who the angel really is? It's me. The angel is me. Because why? Because the Lord is the one that's doing the work all along. Now, he, he anointed and he selected Joshua. And of course, Joshua did a great work as a man, leading him. But always... You have these pictures all throughout the Old Testament. All types of different pictures. And Moses, being the first man, what does he picture? Moses pictures what would be considered like the first advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. Moses came, and Moses led them. He did all the hard part. He led them through the battles and the wars and, and brought them into the wilderness. And then when Joshua shows up, that's the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. So all these pictures are just pictures of the man Christ Jesus to come one day. When you read in your Bible, when you read in the Old Testament, as I have said, and I've preached on six or seven, maybe, maybe even eight, nine, I'm not sure, different typologies in the Bible, every single one of them point to who? The Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That angel is very clearly and indisputably referring to the man Joshua. You know, the man Joshua actually represents specifically, it represents the humanity of the Lord Jesus. Christ, the man. And then that's why you have the Lord in heaven also saying, hey, I'm that angel. Amen. So you have his deity here, the Lord in heaven, and then you also have, of course, who the man Christ Jesus is, of course, fully God, but he had two natures. You have Joshua representing the man, the humanity, the other side. That's why, the, that's why God tells you, hey, my name is in him. What is it always pointing to? Where does all the glory go? There's only one name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The name of glory, the greatest name that has ever been spoken of, was revealed all the way back in the second book, the second book of the Bible, in the book of Exodus. They already told him, even at that point, 
what the name of God would be that we would forever praise and forever glorify. You have these nuggets in your Bible that you can study out and you can figure that out. I believe that it was possible for them to figure that out. When, when you read in the book of Hebrews, the audience clearly already understood that who gave them rest. They understood that in a sense, Joshua gave them rest. When you read in Exodus 33, what does it say? The Lord says, I will give thee rest. You see how you can make these connections all on your own and understand, man, my, my name is in him. They already, God, hey, Joshua was the one. Joshua was that angel that led them in. Joshua was the one that gave them rest. And the Lord said, I will give thee rest. You see, Al, both are true because Jesus really will give us rest. Amen. He'll bring us into that, the real fulfillment. Amen. Joshua gave them temporary rest, right? There were blessings of that, but you know what? Joshua really will give us the real rest, the Lord Jesus Christ. He'll give us the, the spiritual rest, the rest that will never end. It'll go on and on forever and for eternity. Study your Bible. Try to find these jewels and gems on your own. There's a lot of great things in the Bible that can, that can uh, you know, uh, spark or refuel the fire of the love of God's Word in your heart. It's amazing when you study your Bible and you just continually just study and keep finding new things. And it just further proves no man can ever write this book. It's the greatest book that's ever been written. There, there, there are so many just great truths and just the, the depths of God's Word never ends. So just study your Bible. Love your Bibles. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for all the pictures of the Old Testament. We thank you for all the truths that reveal all throughout the Old Testament, dear Lord. We thank you for the name Jesus, dear Lord. We thank you for the King James Bible that, uh, that, that accurately translates there in Acts chapter number 7 and Acts chapter, chapter number, or uh, Hebrews chapter number 4, the name Jesus. So it can give us these truths and we can learn these truths about who that angel was and what your name was to be forevermore, the name of Jesus. Help us to praise and honor and worship and give glory to the name of Jesus all the time and understand how special that name truly is. We love you and be with us. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.